today. Hi, listen, I'm such a fan. What? Yeah. Don't say that. Oh no, I, I watch you. What? I watch you all the time. Mm -mm. I watch you all the time. I was like, I gotta okay. see what she said about this ep this week's episode of Lovecraft because I need to know. You know what I mean? Like, I I appreciate you because we're not usually in this space, like really thought provoking, intellectual um, film critique, not in the mainstream and not yeah. on the YouTube, like people who look like me. Like, I feel like the first time I saw you had like some finger waves and you have like these nails and I was like, but this is what I'm talking about. I where are we? Me. And here we yeah. are. <laughs> you see how we just came full circle here? Listen. And it has, okay. to be, it has to be intentional. That's why I do video, because I want them to see, like, a Black woman watches a sci-fi horror show. Like, I need right. you guys and to watches, it. um, what is the Charlie Kaufman a film? I'm thinking of anything. Yes. Because we, we have an all. opinion. We have an opinion about that film. I loved it. Right? But can we be in the greater good of the world talking about how we love that film? I mean. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> it's been my whole day. Thank you. I appreciate you. But can I, I can I tell you a little bit? Can I tell you how your movie put a smile on my face at Sundance earlier this oh, year? Oh, oh, you I saw it at Sundance. Yes, yes. And I made sure I made it to that premiere. I was just, oh. just like, yes, this gave me oh. my entire life. I oh, can't wow. wait. I've been telling all of my friends about this. It's so exciting um, oh. to watch someone who literally has self trained them, you know, self taught yourself like a playwright, a writer directing your film, going through the Sundance Writing Lab and premiering at Sundance. Just tell me about your experience because I think people really need to understand the journey before you yeah. get to the, the end line. I really want right. to talk about your journey, your experience with making yeah. the zero version. Well, thank you for asking because I know that when you do something that, you know, where you get a public profile, people then go, oh, how did... How did you get here? I mean, this it's been a quite the journey behind the scenes. The the movie started as a web series over six years ago. Um, and it kind of grew out of my frustration of one, not really having many of my plays produced. Like I wanted to make a career as a playwright and, and people were just were not biting um, in the way that I thought they would. And then two, I had just gotten fired off of my first screenwriting gig, like uh, my first uh, feature film, hired gun, you know, um, film, and I was devastated. And so the web series kind of grew out of this, honestly, out of this place of like, well, if I write it, direct it, and star it, and I can't get fired, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so it was a web series for a while. And, you know, I went, uh, before I went to shoot the first two episodes, my mom passed away, and it really changed my life. And so, you know, I went out, as a way to kind of get through grieving my mom and started performing as Rodimus Prime because I had all of this music that I had created as a companion piece to the web series. And then maybe two years later, I went back and looked at the web series and it just didn't feel like the right format for this story. And uh, I wrote it as a pilot because I had been working in TV at that time for different shows. But even then I was like, oh, who's going to cast me? Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm I'm a nobody, nobody knows who I am. I don't have a Hollywood look at all. And so that's when I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna make this independently. It'll be a feature film and I'll shoot it in black and white as homage to all the classic New York films that I love so much, you know? And that took a number of years um, and it took a number of producers, you know? I, I think finding a producer for your film is like dating. And sometimes you like a person, but it's just, it's not gonna be more than one, for one night. You know what I mean? And um, with Lena, I'd known her for years and we were at Sundance 2019 together and she just looked over and was like, when are you gonna let me help you make your movie? All I had to do was say yes to a friend. And now, you know, we have a film that was, people really loved at Sundance. So that's, that's the short version of the journey. No, I appreciate you sharing that because sometimes, I think people think that it's an overnight thing that happens. Like, hey, I called up my friend Lena. Like, as soon as I came with this idea, now we have 40-year-old version. That's not how it happens. Yeah, That's not at all. No. To, yeah, to share the journey, to really, you know, just help enlighten people and also encourage people to not give up. Um, right. But I do find it very interesting that you did choose the black and white. Um, and I like this homage to, like, providing another classical uh, New York film but yeah. specifically 
black and white, it doesn't always work with filming black people on screen. So, <laughs> tell me well, you know, it's, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I, that was an obsession of mine as well as my DP, Eric Bronco, who is, um, you know, as a man of color and a man from the Bronx, we both had this really deep investment in like showing our version of New York. And then like, um, you know, looking at the work of Roy de Carava, who captured Black people in Black and white in a beautiful way, you know, so between, you know, Eric and I's like dogged determination to just, you know, do these camera tests on different skin tones to, you know, making sure that when I did color correction with Nat Jenks at Goldcrest, that like, I was always focusing on people's complexion in the screen because you have people who are my complexion, you have um, Asian actors like Peter Kim, and then you have deep chocolate black actors like Aswin Benjamin. And so with the three of us as kind of like the meter, like how do we set the gray tone so that each of us are popping and look juicy in black and white? Cause it's just something that is so sumptuous to me about um, the spectrum of brown and black and white, but it takes people being really invested in getting it right. And that's what we were kind of obsessed with so that we could look good on screen. Yeah, because I was watching, I was like, half of these movies, they can't even get the lighting right or regular color, right? <laughs> I was like, how did they get this so great? Like in black it's and white, I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. It is the reality. And, um, you know, just looking at different photography books and how um, if the lighting isn't right for a certain skin tone, you know, a black person will look opaque or they'll just look like a shadow. And so like not being afraid of light and dark, um, right. but really trying to find this middle ground so that every single person of color on screen is popping, you know? Mm -hmm. Now your character, what is, I love your character because she really gets to go on this journey and experience love, experience success, you know, and really comes to this crossroads, right? And I think sometimes we talk about this a lot of times where we always have the term of, you know, Black creators selling out. And right. she has this experience. And so in your career, have you ever had to make a choice of staying true to yourself versus selling out to really satisfy the masses? I have actually, you know, like when I went to Hollywood for the first time in 2014, I was working on a number of, of, of shows and um, for playwrights, your plays become your writing sample. It's how you get into a room. I have a play called Casket Sharp that got me into uh, the Empire Writing Room and it got me into the get down because the voices in, in that play tend to be uh, black males from a certain age group. And so I think the head writers or the showrunners of those shows saw a voice that they could connect to the shows that they, they staffed me on. Um, but with that particular play, um, Casket Sharp, I feel like Hollywood really, they love the play and they thought, well, maybe we could make this into a series. And I had to decide for myself that I wasn't interested in a show. The, the, the play is about a black man who returns to his um, decayed hometown, I never say where it is, but it could be Oakland, it could be New Jersey, it could be North New Jersey, to um, revitalize his dead father's funeral parlor, you know, his funeral parlor business. And in the neighborhood, there is all of this um, gang violence. So there are, you know, there's a, there's not a short supply of people to be prepared for their final rights, if, if, if that makes any sense. And so I think Hollywood was like, we should make this into a show. <clears throat> and for myself, I just, I did not want to create a show where every week we were tuning in and focusing on Black death. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was just like, Casket Sharp is going to remain a play. It might be a movie, but I just don't want this to be a world we keep returning to because I just don't know if the Black audience needs to see that now, especially with what's going on in the world with uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Armand Arbery, you know? And so that was the decision where I was like, I know this is what Hollywood wants from me or the industry, but I'm gonna make the decision out of a place of integrity and just try to put a different kind of black story out there. I'm gonna just say no to Hollywood. And, um, you know, I think for maybe for a younger um, writer who is looking for the big break, it, it can be really challenging. But I think the blessing of being this age in the industry is like, I really know who I am and I know 
the kind of stories I want to tell. And because we've had, you know, so far we've had some success with the film, people really love it. It's telling me that I can continue to write about a contemplative black character um, and use humor to talk about some not so funny things around racism and sexism um, that I, it's okay to not necessarily go in the direction that Hollywood would expect me to, but to continue to, to go down this path of like independent, quieter, or more intricate black stories. Does that make sense? It did make sense. Okay. <laughs> I was like, give everybody a word today. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Like you literally, I was having a case of the Mondays and you put a smile on my face today. I oh, heard, I, I listen, was, please keep doing what you're doing, sis. We need you in that space. You know, like it's so rare that we get to see folks who look like us in this space coming from this very like intellectual, smart, stimulating point of view about films. Like for me, I'm not a typical activist. Like film is my activism. And so we need you know, people on both sides of the coin kind of talking about story and talking about all kinds of stories, not just black stories, you know? So thank you. I'm so, ha I'm so happy to be here. It must mean I I've done something right. Oh, you're amazing. I cannot wait. <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, you too. And I'll, when the world opens up, I'm sure I'll see you at some event. Of you course. know what I mean? All right. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me.